what you're being. everybody here tonight. Thank you for uh, being faithful. The Cater Baptist Church welcomes you. Let's all stand if you would, please. Looking forward to a good night in the Word and the Lord. 512, if you would. Let's start there. 512 in your songbooks. 512. Saint love. Let's sing the first, second, and the third is the last. Number 512. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Let's 
go to our mission letter for tonight. <clears throat> we got a letter this week from our missionaries in Arctic Canada, the Hollands, and so that just made me think, wow, um, we can, uh, I don't want to say be ungrateful or something like that, but uh, we thought, oh man, it's freezing cold out here. It can always be colder, amen? And here's some folks up way, way, way up in the north. And uh, so he writes, October, December 2023, and he says, ministry update, praise the Lord for another good year in Norman Wells. We saw one new lady come to Christ. We've also seen some of our believers showing signs of growth this year. We continue to have a good group of souls come to church on Sundays. We also started a Thursday night Bible study and discipleship course this year. Please continue to pray for our folks daily as there are many battles. And the devil does not want them to have victory. Northern Living, we are currently in Edmonton doing our yearly stock up trip. The winter road was again an adventure. We haven't had much snow this year, so many of the holes and bumps were not filled. It took a few days, but we made it to the big city. We have much to get done, chiropractor, eye doctor, dentist, and of course, necessary shopping. With the lack of barges this summer, the winter road is going to get extremely busy as the season rolls along. With each day, the ice crossings thicken for heavier loads. We are praying to get everything done and get back up north before all the big rigs start north. This is prayer request, permanent resident status, pray for a new building, physical and spiritual healing for church folks. That is an unspoken request he has prayer for. He says praises new folks in the church, contacts in the state too, and God's provision in our lives. And he says, thank you, another year has come to a close. Time rushes on, especially the older one gets. We often reflect on the faithfulness and generosity of all our supporting churches and brethren we thank you for being a part of our ministry in the far north. His first day to John, uh, Todd and Jody Holland, uh, your missionaries there to Arctic Canada, and the same two there, and the other folks that they run into and meet. Please be in prayer for those folks. And with our other prayer requests, uh, prayer, uh, other missionaries, I should say, are in the back of your bulletin, and uh, try to take some time each, each week and pray for some of those folks that are in the front lines of the spiritual warfare, trying to get the gospel out. We appreciate the work they do. Let's take our songbooks once again. Turn to 528, if you would please. 528. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Let's do all three verses. Number 528. <clears throat> I'd love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true. Tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and learn this from. How much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me. And he led me in the way I often go. No one Jesus, there's no other friend so kind as me. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me when he was so us. More and more I understand his words of love. Blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else can take sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared. Take time.
time for a testimony or two in just a moment here. Let's turn to 247, if you would. 247, Spirit of Living God, fall fresh on me. That's our prayer for tonight. Anytime we're in church, throughout our week, we want the Spirit of God moving in our life and in our, our way and our walk with God. 247, sing that with us. Spirit of the Living God, 247. <laughs> Joseph Lee. Um, well, last week on the trip that I took to New York, we had some slippery, wet, silly roads, and I thank God that he kept us safe. Even though we took a little bit of a slide a few times, we stayed on the road. Amen. Yeah, I've heard something about the reliability of the vehicle you were in, or I experienced something of that as well. But uh, praise the Lord, we were safe, and we got home safe, thank the Lord for that. Anybody else? One more. God's been good, amen? Let's take our songbooks, go to 335, if you would. While you're thinking about that, we'll sing this chorus, shall we? 335, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. In his wonderful face. 335. Turn. Psalm 62. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Beat me to the rock. Psalm 62. 61 and verse 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. Cry unto thee. Cry unto thee. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is over. Testimony, real quick. Anybody else? One more. Uh, right here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, for those of, like where people that were traveling on Saturday and also this morning, like during the snow or whatever, snowy roads. People, people safe on the roads. Yes. For yes. People Amen. safe. I got, right. I got up this morning and uh, I said, you know, I'm gonna drive the road real quick. God, man, you me. The four wheel drive doesn't work. Amen. And uh, so I drove up, drove up the road, you know, just went to Vito Road, went down a little ways, and uh, stopped really fast, you know, and uh, didn't slide at all. There's no ice or no snow on the road at all. But I said, if I put this on Facebook, it's going to be like, you know, come on, folks, you got to come to church or something. You know, I don't want people to be uh, uncomfortable or something like that. I know different people have different feelings about the road, you know, when it gets messy out there. But uh, I, so I thought, you know, I could put it on there. I, I might not put it on there. I decided to put it on there. That's just... You know, I, I don't know how, how to explain it, but uh, sometimes you, you don't want to feel like you're manipulating people or something like that. But, uh, 
Anyways, let's take our Bibles. We're going to get into the preaching here. James chapter 4, if you would please. James chapter 4. Again, appreciate everybody being here tonight. I know we got some visitor, a visitor back here. I don't think I've seen you before. So glad that you're here. Why don't you tell us your name real quick? Tell us your name. Mike. 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 Glenn, Mike yeah. Glenn, very nice yeah. to have you with us tonight as well. All right, let's all stand if you would. James chapter 4, we're going to read these verses responsibly, as is our custom to do. Sunday morning, Sunday, Sunday night, anyways, we do that. And uh, we'll read the first 10 verses here, so I'll read verse 1. You'll join me on verse 2 if you would, and so on. Every other verse throughout the passage, out loud, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. From whence come... Wars and fightings among you come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members ye lust and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain ye fight and war yet ye have not because ye ask not ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And I am going to talk about the subject, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, how to avoid friendship with the world. How to avoid friendship with the world. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for my opportunity here to try to preach to these folks and help them with uh, just an understanding of your word and taking through several verses here, showing what the Bible uh, teaches and a truth uh, that I think can help them, help them protect, protect them from a, a fallacy or from a, a mistake, an error that a lot of people make today. And I pray that you'd help us to be conformed to the image of your son. Lord, help us to be love, love you, love your son, Jesus Christ, fall in love with Jesus more and more, walk with Jesus, help us be people that walk with God, and that people know the book. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to know the book, and uh, tonight be a night that we you know, add on to you know, that, that large, the proverbial eating of the elephant, the large, huge you know, goal of knowing the Bible better and growing spiritually. Let's, uh, let's get one, one more step down the road to that fulfillment of uh, being conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, we love you. We ask you your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. It's been a joy for me to hear some of the stories of the victories and just some of the different opportunities that my father has had, my dad, and his ministry in recent months as he'll tell me, you know, hey, Andrew, i got to tell you about this. I'm going to have to talk to, you know, an Amish couple. Maybe it's an older, older Amish couple, right? And we talked about the gospel or... You know, once in a while, I'm like, hey, you know, I talked to your second cousin, so-and-so, I talked to your aunt or somebody, you know, and most of the time I'm thinking, okay, I'm not sure I know who that is, but I'm glad to hear it, you know, I'm really glad um, to hear that news, but uh, he's, he's just, he's been able to reach some objectives that used to be very, very slow and, and difficult, and uh, often actually, we want, you know, wind up talking about some of the specific doctrinal issues with them or specific scriptures that were influential to him. And pointed him to the truth and, and helped him to know the biblical mindset on some of the differences you know, that we have. And uh, that's a, it's a blessing to hear about. When I know that the truth is being spoken. I don't know, there, there might be somebody who might say, you know, we talked about worldliness here in the text. Maybe somebody would say, you know, don't Amish and other, you know, similar sects like that. Do they maybe have a point with regard to separation or, you know, staying away from worldliness in a positive way? In the scripture we read there, our text was verse number four. The adulterers and adulteresses. Now, this is pretty strong language, right? You say, hey, the way you guys are thinking, it's like adulterous thinking. Okay, wow. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's our text verse tonight. Very, very strong language. It says, look, we need to make sure we stay far, far away from worldliness. It's extremely important. We need to make sure that there's not one ounce of our friendship with the world in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. It's vital. But now we are in the world. Okay, we, there, there's plenty of scripture on the fact that we shouldn't just withdraw to some complex or something. All this become nuns and, and monks or something like that. 
uh, clearly that's not what the apostles did in the book of Acts. They went out to where people were. They engaged in a spiritual warfare. They affected the culture. They preached where a lot of people were, and the spirit does not seem to reprove them for worldliness. You know, just because they were out in the world influencing people. And Jesus, of course, did the same thing. It's the same in the Old Testament. Many good people are lifted up as role models and examples. You know, people like Noah and Enoch and, and David and Elijah and Elisha and Daniel. And a lot of these folks, what we know, they didn't call up in a monastery, right? They, they went out. They preached. They wrote sermons and psalms, which were widely disseminated in many cases. They lived lives of statesmen in some cases. They had contact with people of all types. But they were not reprimanded for worldliness by the spirit or by a prophet. They're certainly not portrayed as being at enmity with God. They're portrayed as servants of God, as, as people doing the will of God, as examples for us who want to do the will of God. So all that to say, what exactly is the line that the scriptures draw? What exactly is worldliness? How do we define it? And to me, our text shows that this is a very important issue and a very important question. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Look, we cannot have the blessings of God on our church and on our ministry and our family, on the entire group of like-minded believers like us all over the world. We will not have the blessings of God if we are in enmity with God. It's vital that we stay away from worldliness. So I just want to take this evening and help everybody on an individual level understand what the Bible teaches worldliness is and what it is not. Okay? And how to avoid it. Of course, all the teaching about you know, just outlining a plan for how to stay away from worldliness. Once we know precisely scripturally what worldliness is, it's, it's easier to figure that out. And we'll just let the scriptures be our guide on this journey. So let's start by defining it. Actually, as I finished, got through the entire preparation here, it looks like uh, that's really what we're doing tonight. And I, I add in the here's how to stay away from it kind of as we go through the definition. Three, but we're going to define it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have three points um, under the definition here. Notice, first of all, in this passage, the association of lust with worldliness, worldliness and lust. Look back at the passage there. Verse number one, he talks about the lust that war in your members. Verse two, he talks about how you lust and desire to have. In verse three, he talks about consuming things upon your lust. Finally, in verse four, he says, you know what I think we need to address here is the issue of worldliness. It's too much friendship with the world that is associated here with lust and lustful desires. Verse 5 as well talks about lust again. And this is a pattern in the Word of God, my friend. I'm going to show you that. Flip over, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. 2 Peter chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'll mention another one in Titus uh, chapter 2. One of the verses talks about denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Lust and worldliness go hand in hand, according to James chapter 4 there. And now we see Titus chapter 2 does the same again. Now, we do live in this present world, as he says there. It's not a sin to be in the world, but it's wrong to be worldly, to be a friend of the world. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 2. 2 Peter 1 verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this last verse teaches us that a lot of the corruption that is in the world and has been for thousands of years is through or is associated with lust. Let me say that. Lust causes worldliness or it goes right along with it. That's the third passage we've seen that gives us that idea. So if you would, to Mark, please. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4, the second book of the New Testament, Mark chapter 4. So some synonyms of this word, lust, would be desire. We've seen that. Another would be covet covetousness, right? The word lust we use as a noun or a verb, so we get to a verb, covet, or a noun, covetousness, okay? Covetousness is clearly a sin in the word of God, my friend. The Tenth Commandment says, thou shalt not covet. Look, it's wrong. Coveting, there in, in the Tenth Commandment, back in Exodus chapter 20, it talks about coveting your neighbor's wife, or coveting some of his possessions, his livestock, his donkey, coveting his house. So it's the idea of wanting, or, or lusting after, or desiring the things you don't have. Things you see other people get to have and you don't have them, that is type of lust. 
right? Uh, lusting after a woman who's not your wife or a man who's not your husband. Desiring a nice vehicle that you can't afford. Looking through magazines, seeing a house that's outside of your budget. But you allow yourself to be discontented with the house that you have because somebody else you know has a really nice house. I think I mentioned before, you know, if you do go visit somebody else, they happen to have a beautiful house. It's nicer than yours. You know what the spiritual mindset is? Thank you, Lord, that these people have what they need. Thank you for blessing them. I'm happy for them. And by the way, I'm very thankful for the house that I have, you know, that I don't live in a bungalow. I think we can all be thankful for that. You know, in many places in this world, people are living in cardboard boxes or little small structures literally built out of trash at the dump. Uh, many, many places around through the world, even some places where it's very cold, just like here, there are people who have to put up with that type of lifestyle. You know, that there's all sorts of reasons for each person in the room tonight to be very content with the things that we have. But I'm just saying one thing that what we're trying to tell you tonight is that it is a worldly mindset whenever you find yourself thinking, man, I don't have that, I wish I did. Uh, look, looking over it, man, I wish I had that person's spouse, I wish I had their car, I wish I had their burden bearer, you know, like in the Old Testament, they had the donkeys and all of that. That is not a good mindset for the Christian. Look, the Christian says, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. A treasure laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We don't have a bunch of physical possessions around us that are all going to burn up one day, consuming our minds and just saying, I, I need better stuff. I, I need more stuff. I, I deserve a better house. I want some better vacations. I want a better car. That's not the Christian mindset. That's a worldly mindset. I'm defining for you what worldliness is tonight. And that's number one. Mark chapter four, if you would. Mark chapter four, Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus is the speaker here. And he's just given the parable of the sower. Now, he's going to go back now and he's going to explain some of the, the meaning of the parable, each individual portion of the, of the parable, the owner of the parable, I should say. Mark 4, look at verse 18. Mark 4, 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So Jesus is generalizing about the types of things that come into our lives. And even though we have somebody preaching the word to us, investing in us, we've got people telling us how to witness and influencing us to bring forth fruit and be productive as Christians, we end up bringing forth little or no fruit because there are other things clouding up our priorities and our time and Jesus and, and our attention, right? And Jesus says those things are the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the what? The lust of other things, right? So again, we see the association of things of the world and lust, and a worldly mindset and lust, covetousness, wanting and desiring things uh, that either aren't ours, we can't afford, etc. So four times now, four different passages that we've seen that directly associate worldliness and lust. Lust is a very closely related thing to a worldly philosophy or worldliness. So if, if you're talking to me or somebody who understands worldliness and say, you know, Christians in America are so worldly today, what do they mean? One thing they mean is lustfulness and it's covetousness. So that's number one tonight, defining worldliness, what it is, lustfulness and covetousness. Now, of course, just desires in and of themselves are not wrong. I want to make sure I mention that. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Did you know the Lord sometimes can just give you desires? Amen. God gives us some of our desires. Desires in and of themselves are not wrong. You know what the Bible calls Ezekiel's wife? He says, that's the desire of thine eyes, right? It was fine in the Old Testament. You know, you're reading through the Old Testament, one of the laws I was reading. If, you, if they went into a city, they defeated the city. But then one of the men saw one of the virgin women in that city and had a desire unto her that she might be his wife instead. The Bible says that was fine. They had procedures they had to go through for cleansing and stuff, purification. But he, he could have her as his wife. So where do we draw the line on desires, Pastor? Where, you know, hey, this, this is a good desire and this is a bad desire. Well, actually, it's really simple. When you desire things that are within your reach or that are already yours, you desire them and appreciate them, that's wonderful. Or things, you know, that aren't already somebody else's. When David looked out that window or from the rooftop there and he saw a woman and began to desire her and lust after her, right away that was wrong because it was somebody else's wife. But when a man has a desire after his own wife, that's honorable, the Bible says. That's virtuous. That's wonderful. That pleases God. When you desire things that you can afford and you're still laying up treasure in heaven, you're still a good church member, your affections are on things above, not on those things on the earth, but obviously we all have legitimate physical needs and we have legitimate desires, those are fine. They're often from God. But when we look around at somebody else's car, it's when we look on that commercial, it's when we, you know, there's something we know we can't afford or that would at least take away some of our ability to invest in heaven and to lay up our treasure in heaven, but we want it anyway, that's wrong. That's an inordinate desire. In fact, in the Bible, I think I mentioned this before, 
There's a clear distinction between the words jealousy and envy, okay? In the Bible, jealousy was always a good thing. Your God is a jealous God, the Bible says, okay? He made the world. He gave us our lives. He made our very souls themselves. He provides for us our needs. So our worship and our faith and our love and our devotion belongs to him. It's rightfully his. When we give those to somebody else, it's spiritual adultery, the Bible says. And God says, look, I'm a jealous God. What's mine is mine. I'm not okay with somebody else, some other deity, getting your worship and your praise and your love and your faith and your devotion. That's wrong. Those things are mine. He's a jealous God. When a righteous husband says, look, my wife is mine. I'm not going to share her. She's going to dress appropriately and modestly. That's jealousy. And that's a good thing the Bible says. Jealousy. Envy is different. Okay? Envy is seeing what somebody else gets to be or something they get to have. Wishing you had the same, wishing you could be the same, or sort of desiring something bad to happen even to that person so that they don't get to continue to have it better than you do. And you covet their possessions, you covet, covet their influence or their status. Envy is wicked. The Bible says envy is like a rottenness in your bones. But jealousy is a good thing. Flip over to Proverbs chapter 30, if you look at these. Proverbs chapter 30. Hope that helps you with understanding where jealousy and envy are in the word of God. A lot of times, if you're just in a conversation, you might mix that up. You might say jealousy when you really mean envy, right? You're jealous of me. Well, but you might be envy. But envy is just another one of, you know, a, <coughs> excuse me, a synonym in this family of synonyms we've given it tonight. Lust and desire, covet, covetousness, and envy. Now, these are not good attitudes of a Christian. These are attitudes of worldly people and weak Christians who are carnal and worldly. The Bible teaches that godliness with contentment is great gain. So it's not the mindset of the spirit-filled Christian. The desire that some people develop, you know, where they, they get up every morning and most of their energy throughout the day, most of their time is spent just going after the almighty dollar, looking for some opportunity to become wealthy and make a pile of money that's all going to burn up one day. Maybe you've heard some of the lectures or the program of Dave Ramsey, uh, he's a, a financial teacher, he has Financial Peace University. In America today, sadly, there are a lot of Christians that are far too far, too far in debt uh, to be pleasing to the Lord. They don't really have a financial plan or... They don't have a lot of self-discipline, or they're just really un unorganized in their finances, very flim flam in their finances. But honestly, I do think that they could benefit greatly from some of the teachings of Dave Ramsey. Okay, I believe that. But let me say, if you follow all of Dave Ramsey's advice, he, he just sneaks a little too much in there of, hey, I, I can help you be a wealthy person. I can make you rich. You can get rich. Here's how to do it. And I don't believe that that's the wisest or most, my, most biblical mindset and philosophy. And here's one of the clearest scriptures why. I, I think we might have looked at it before, but I want to show you again. Proverbs 30 and verse number 7. Proverbs 37 looks for, it says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So listen, folks, the spiritual mind, the spiritual mindset is I don't desire to be rich, but I don't desire to be poor either necessarily. There's a balance. Okay? I, I want to have a good testimony. I want my heart to belong to the Lord. You know, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't want the big amounts of money and possessions distracting me from my walk with God and my more important priorities, which are the spiritual realm priorities. And, and focusing it all on stuff that's just all going to burn up one day. And it pulls my heart away from God. I don't want God to have all of my heart. But I also don't want to have a poor testimony. You know, where I'm not taking good care of my family. Or maybe I'm tempted to be dishonest or steal or be deceitful with people. So you know what, God? Here's my prayer. I ask that maybe you could just take care of all my legitimate needs and allow me to focus my heart on finding wisdom. Allow me to focus my heart on loving God. Allow me to focus on giving God my whole heart, my walk with God, my relationship with the Lord. And that is a much more biblical attitude than a part of me just seeking for money all the time, seeking wealth, seeking, just telling myself, well, hey, if I can get, become more wealthy, you know, that I can afford to, you know, give more money to the church, give more money to missions, give more money to the Lord's work. Look, God owns a cattle on a thousand bills. If he feels like we need more money coming in, I think he can figure out a way to get it to us. He wants for us to focus on loving him first and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he promises if we do that, everything that we truly need will be added to us. Now, I don't think we should be lazy, and I don't think that we should allow disorganization in our finances. We shouldn't just ignore a beautiful opportunity that falls in our lap in order to be able to you know, make some funds again for the kingdom of God. But we shouldn't be discontented, and we shouldn't be often trying to get more money and trying to become wealthy. Flip over if you went to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, if you would, this is a passage that I 
quoted a moment ago. Uh, Godliness with contentment. It's great. Again, I think we mentioned the verse this morning. It doesn't address worldliness directly here, but it gives some more instruction about this topic that we're talking about. That, that balance that a Christian needs to strike between faith, believing God, and supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not tempting the Lord, and not being lazy or disorganized, just being content, not being covetous, not being lustful after filthy lucre, not constantly looking to become wealthy, but appropriately, like I said, having our eyes open. And if that God does put you know, a, a good side hustle in your path or a better job or a promotion, in all of this, there's a balance, right? There's a righteous, godly mindset. And there's a worldly mindset. David was a very wealthy guy. Solomon was a very wealthy guy. Filled with the Spirit in the will of God and writing Bible passages, right? They're very wealthy people. There's many people in the Bible who wrote the Bible, very poor people. And so there's a balance. Look there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse number 6, the verse we quoted, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but God did us with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. He doesn't even mention a house living in this verse. You know, one that's actually warm in the winter and livable in the summer. Which most of the time, most of us here in the U.S. of A., we've got it, right? He just says, look, if you've got food to eat, and if you've got something to wear, and it's not like, well, you know, I've, I'm time for this to go in the wash, but I literally have nothing else to wear in the meantime. If, 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 by the way, there's people like that, that that are in this world, okay? They have to deal with that somehow. Uh, use your imagination, amen? But he says, look, if you've got food and you've got two pairs of clothes, one to wear while the other one's in the wash... You need to be content with the things that you have. How many times over more than that do we have in America? And so I think we see no reason for ourselves to be a lustful, covetous person constantly. Man, my state in life just isn't as good as it should be. I get to make it better or something like that. Here in the U.S., I think we, just, we need to be contented people. Amen. That's what this teaching is. But watch this now. Verse 9. We stop there, right? But they that will be rich, people that want to be rich, they try to be rich, they, they desire to be rich, they have a will to be rich. People that will be rich fall. Into temptation and a snare. A snare is basically a trap. We pay the sixteen of English. And to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And, you know, I think it's interesting. We take a step back and think. This is we're, we're in a pastoral epistle here. Okay, so quite possibly the main thrust here is to Timothy personally, since he's a pastor, and you know the, us preachers out here, we, we, our temptation is the same, just like everybody else. Hey, we got a unique skill set. You know, maybe I can become a motivational speaker. Maybe I can become a powerful writer or author. You know, some of those folks make very good money, or some other side job where you, you become very wealthy, some other you know source of income. Now you got funds to go out and do the work of God. You know, funds to help the church, funds to help get the gospel out. And Paul says, folks, and Paul says, T uh, uh, Timothy, you watch out. The devil's sly. He's good at what he does. Specifically, the love of money, and he today that will be rich. People who want to be wealthy, they go about doing things to become wealthy. They wind up falling. They wind up getting trapped. They fall for temptations of Satan that they would not otherwise have fallen for if they didn't have this desire for more money and to, to uh, obtain more things. So he tells Timothy, look, make sure that you don't wind up with that mindset. Be wise, of course. Don't just turn away opportunities that God puts in your path, but be content with what you have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, if you would, go over to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. So we said we're going to define worldliness from a biblical perspective. What, what does the Bible say worldliness is? What does the Bible mean when it says, you know, these people in Corinth are too worldly or something like that? Number one, it means lust and you know, the desires. Desiring things you shouldn't have. Desiring things that aren't yours. Sexual lust. Lusting after a woman or man that isn't yours. Lusting after money or possessions that are going to burn up. Allowing yourself to become unfruitful because of those lusts. Allowing yourself to be caught up in the snare of the devil because you can't be content with what you have. You can't be content with just, you know, laying up treasure in heaven. Falling in love with Jesus, walking with God. That's the first definition of worldliness. It's the, the lustfulness and the covetousness that comes from a worldly mindset. Next, look with me at uh, Romans chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. The Bible says, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies and make sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. But... Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does it mean to be worldly? Number two, it means being conformed to the world. And that's contrasted here with being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I think that really has a lot to do with the word of God. Reading the word of God constantly, it's a cleanser, right? And uh, if you would uh, jump over with me to chapter 8, if you would.
where we put it in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8, just a couple of pages back over there. This word conform in that exact form is only found in two places in the whole Bible, Romans 8 and Romans 12. Okay, so we're going to look at the other one here. Romans 8, <coughs> Romans 8, look at that in the very famous verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called, the called according to his purpose. In verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, of course, verse 29 is not talking about being predestined to salvation. It says clearly, whom God foreknew, he, he had the knowledge that they will be saved, them, he decided to give a destination. He predestined them, not to be saved, but to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The goal in saving us wasn't just that we don't go to hell. It was many other things. One of them was so that we could begin to taste now the abundant life in Christ, which comes by our conforming less and less to the world and more and more to the image of Christ. Ephesians gives the ultimate completion of the idea. It says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's going to blow your mind if you think about it long enough, right? But Christians are supposed to follow Christ. We're supposed to emulate him. We're supposed to make him our example. We're supposed to try to be like Christ. And it's sort of like a spectrum in my mind where, you know, going one way means you're going farther and farther away from the other way. If you continue to be more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God, you're less and less conformed to this world. But by the same token, the opposite is also true. If I allow the devil and the flesh to pull me more and more to being conformed to the world compared to the image of Christ, where am I going? I'm going away from it. I'm less and less conformed to the image of Christ. That's another thing the Bible means, or perhaps, again, in a conversation or in a sermon, we say, you know, Christians today are so worldly. What do we mean? We mean that they're lustful, covetous, and then we mean that they're conformed to this world. And, and what I mean by that is with our actions, with the way that we dress, just with our lifestyle, the, the action, the things that we do. Now, the second point here is where I think we get into some level of subjectivity. It can simply, it, it depends on what person you're talking to. It's simply worldliness in the eye of the beholder. And so therefore, the best case scenario is you got a chapter and a verse. You've got a scripture that backs up the fact of what you're calling worldliness is actually biblical, uh, biblically worldly. The reason why I say that is, you know, worldliness can just become a catch-all if you're not careful for, well, we ain't never done it that way before. Well, that's something I don't really like. I'm not comfortable with that. That's not one of my preferences or whatever. And so, the, well, why don't we label it worldly? I think it's worldly then. Okay. And specifically, you know, I mentioned in the introduction here, the, the Amish, when we were talking, you know, about my dad and his work. I remember this one time we were, <clears throat> we were working with some Amish folks doing some roofing uh, jobs. I got in the car this morning. It's like a 20-minute drive or so to the job site we were going to. And so I pulled out a laptop computer, and I started playing a game. I think it was called Peggle, the one where you, these balls bounce around. You try to do some skill or luck or aim or whatever and try to score points, right? And I remember the Amish guy sitting next to me here on this side. He looked at that game and that computer, and he just, man, I just, I can't believe you're so worldly. You know, I don't know if he's worded it that way to me, but I could tell that was what was going on, going through his mind, right? And I'm just thinking, you know, dude, you were smoking your cigarettes yesterday. <laughs> you know, don't judge, right? But uh, where, where do we go with that? You know, is it just, well, that's newer technology. It's probably worldly, you know, or, or is it just, hey, that's something I'm uncomfortable with. I can probably just call it worldly, and that'll make me a better lifestyle. So I don't believe that's necessarily wise. I think it behooves us to get some scripture, okay, to take a biblical principle and, and have a chapter and verse that backs up what you're going to find is worldly, okay? I'll just give you one example and kind of move on here. Uh, flip over to 1 Timothy, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 is a familiar verse, verse 9, dress standards, right? Dress standards can certainly be a point of contention or separation um, in a lot of different cultures. So this is a verse that gives some specifics on ladies' dress. What is the spiritual mindset on ladies' dress? Is it really that important? Does God just not care about it at all? Because, well, man, it looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, right? We debunked that once. We turned over to Jesus' sermon, and Jesus said very clearly, cleanse first the outside of the cup of platter, that the outside, the inside of the cup of platter, that the outside may be clean also. Because if you got a cup that's dirty out, inside, but clean outside, nobody really wants, cares about the outside. Then. They're just not going to drink out of it. So he says, what you do is you clean first the inside, now when you clean the outside, now somebody will think that. Now it makes sense. It'll be profitable. But Jesus didn't say the outside doesn't matter at all. He just said, no, clean them both. Clean the inside first. Put a priority on the inside, but the outside needs to be clean too, right? But verses like this and several others we could show 
uh, clearly show that God has instructions and expectations and standards regarding outward appearance, like long hair on men, you know, 1 Corinthians 11, etc., etc. Look there in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Listen, I don't think this verse is saying that you can never wear gold or pearl. My wife wears gold. Rather, I, I, I'm talking about I'm talking about like a wedding band or something like that. Cultures change, right? This is not saying there's a moral problem with wearing gold or pearls. Rather, what it's talking about is the focus of how you adorn yourself, how you make yourself look for what you, we all try to do stuff to make ourselves look good, right? Comb your hair, you don't want to look uh, disheveled, a bad testimony or something. He says, what you should be doing in order to adorn yourself shouldn't be outward, it should be about good works. It should be about being conformed to the image of Christ and not showy fancy clothes or hairdos. So if you do wear gold or pearls, hoping that somebody will say, oh, look at that person, they must be well to do. They can afford to wear gold. And so that they notice you, that is not modest. That's what he's saying. It's one of the things that he's saying. You understand, modest has a couple different definitions, okay? Uh, basically, we might say a man of modest means. You know, you might say, I'm a person of modest income. What does that mean? It, mean, it wouldn't really be a noticeable one, okay? If you got 14 different people, you're doing their taxes, you notice the guy who's making 1.6 million. It's like, whoa, you know, what would be like to live like that guy, right? He's, a no he's got a noticeable uh, income. Okay, you, I would say, look, I'm a man of modest means, or a man of modest income, right? Because it wouldn't be something that would grab your attention if it's on a sheet, and you're looking at different ones or something. Modest clothing is essentially clothes that don't draw attention to them, okay? Certainly women who wear the halter top, the plunging neckline, the mini skirt, that would draw attention in a very inappropriate way. So that's not modest, okay? That's one way that you violate the principle that we're given here. Those clothes aren't modest. There's other places we can go in the scripture to back that up. We're not gonna go that direction tonight, but just, you know, clothes, clothes that are intended to be gaudy. Clothes, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> clothes that are intended to be over the top, noticeable, flashy, and, and make people say, whoa, they must be rich, they must be intelligent, they must be awesome as a person because they're wearing to wear those clothes. But I think Jesus himself is a great example as we see him in the word of God. Remember the garden? The betrayer was talking about it. They were conspiring to, to capture Jesus or to arrest him or whatever. And that betrayer said to the other men, he said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk up to him and give him a kiss so that you know which fellow to arrest. You know what that tells me is that Jesus was dressed just like the rest of them. He was dressed just like common fishermen, like a tax collector might be dressed, like a businessman might be dressed, like a common uh, laborer might be dressed. In other words, he didn't have on a certain outfit that said, hey, look at me, I'm the priest, look at me, I'm really religious, look at me, I'm the prophet, okay? Certainly didn't have an effeminate look about him, right? Or Judas would just say, hey, you know, the guy with the long hair and the summer dress, right? He wasn't like that. Jesus fit right in with the manual labor men, with the strong fishermen and stuff like that. Jesus even said, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing, because apparently there were men, you know, they wore long clothing to be noticed, to go along with people calling them rabbi, rabbi, and get the salutations in the marketplace and the uppermost rooms at feasts. They wore clothing to be noticed. I think they essentially do the same thing today. I don't know if you've noticed this, or maybe on the news or something. Hey, here's rabbi so-and-so. He's coming to weigh in, and, you know, he's got dark, long clothes. And he's got a weird, funny hat that looks uncommon, right? And these two curly strands coming down the hair like this. Who knows what I'm talking about? Two curly strands of hair, Okay. Some people do. Actually, I think it's funny. If, you see, if you've seen very many Amish men, you see the Jewish man like that, there's a lot of similarity. They have the same kind of hat. It's a black hat, and it's not, you know, a, a cowboy hat will have the, the, the ends folded up to the sides, right? You can't do that if you're Amish. Most, most districts, that's against the rules. It's, it's actually written right in the rule book, right? And so they got the straight side hat, right? And so except for those strands of cur curly strands of hair, you know, it actually looks very similar. The, the, there's dark clothes and, and, the, and the, the straight, you know, really kind of a bland looking dress, but the, the you know, thread, I mean, clothing. And, uh, <coughs> but I think it, it's, in their mind, it's supposed to be like, ooh, ooh, there's a religious person when you see that. There's a person who lives out their faith. In fact, you might notice in court, sometimes Amish people will get special consideration <coughs> for that reason. You know, if it's, say, a religious freedom case or something like that. It's like, well, man, we, we can all see this person's really serious about his religion because of his clothes. He's living out his faith, right? But I think that biblically that's a violation of the biblical principle that we don't dress a certain way intentionally to garner attention. That's not dressing modestly, the Bible says. That's dressing in a way that draws attention. 
Now, of course, God sees your heart. You know, if you're sincerely attempting to be modest with your dress, but certain styles of the world are so immodest, that draws attention to the fact that you are modest. Well, that's not wrong at all. That's, just, that's a good thing. You, you're being a good testimony for God, I believe, in that case. So I'm just talking about, the, you know, you, you talk to Amish long enough, you'll find it's this feeling of, hey, we're martyrs. Oh, man, we're suffering for Jesus because we got to dress like this. In fact, you know, yeah, they're going to look at us crosswise for, our, for the way we dress. But that's not scriptural at all. That's, that's like the guy in Isaiah 65 who said, hey, you know, I'm holier than thou. You, you stay away from me. I'm holier than thou, right? It's not, I don't believe it's a biblical mindset at all. And so that's my opinion when you talk about, you know, well, worldliness, you know, shouldn't we stay a long, long ways away from worldliness? Look, I think that, number one, we should dress in a nice, um, you know, a business-like way. You know, let's say I work for a, an insurance firm or something like that, and I show up in shoddy clothes, and my hair's not combed, and my, you know, my appearance isn't what it should be, that reflects bad upon that company, okay? And I think it's the same way when you talk about church. How should, you know, should we dress up for church? Or should we, you know, look nice for different things? Of, you know, maybe when we go soul winning or something like that. I think that if we show up and we're just slovenly, uh, we have, you know, dirt on our clothes or something. And obviously there's, there's, there's always asterisks for all of this stuff, you know? But by the way, sometimes I'm sitting there in my study and I'm just like, I could rabbit trail into an asterisk, you know, I could just skip over that and help, hope that people understand. You know, sometimes you're coming from work and you're going to be dirty, but I want you to go to someone again, okay? I'll give you a baby wipe on the way while we're driving away or something like that, right? But there's always a caveat to some of the stuff that I'm saying. I'm just giving you the principle, okay? The principle is that when I decide how I should dress, I don't think it should be, you know, hey, when I'm in the airport, I got to wear something to make sure people say, whoa, there goes one of those Amish people. There's one of those one of those religious people. Whoa. Oh, that's a, that's a Jewish rabbi. Man, he's religious, right? Oh, that's a Catholic priest. Wouldn't you, if it's a Catholic priest and he's in his garb, you'll notice him every time, won't you? I think that's wrong scripturally because it's drawing attention to myself. One guy called it religious cosplay. I don't know if you can study up on what that means. It's kind of funny when you look at it. But uh, it's just that we got to dress up. We got to dress the part, right? And so, <coughs> excuse me. And just quickly, number three, as we'll close here. Defining worldliness, number three, avoid a worldly mentality. Worldly mentality. We said number one, the lustfulness, the covetousness. Number two is the, um, uh, I didn't write it down in here for the, for, the, uh, for the review. I said that it's a being conformed to the, to the world, right? Conformed in our dress, conformed in the way we act, conformed in our life, right? And then number three, with our mind, with our belief system, we can get a worldly mentality. Again, here I would say you have to back up your definition with scripture. But you know, more and more today, there's people that are calling themselves Christians, getting their beliefs and their opinions from Hollywood, getting their beliefs and their ideology from Madison Avenue and from the television, from the fiction like Star Wars, it's very demonstrable, from newspapers, instead of from the Word of God. That's why it's so important to read the Word of God every day. Come to church regularly. You know, if you start hearing preaching that's clearly straight from the Bible, but you have this voice in your head that says, hold on a second, that's not right, is it? That's not moral, is it? Well, you need to ask yourself how much time you spend reading the Word of God and listening to preaching compared to how long you listen to talk radio, compared to how much you listen to or look at news on your phone or something on the TV and all the sitcoms and all the other just stuff that bombards your mind throughout this week. You ever get to the point where it's like, wait, is that what the Bible, that's not what the Bible says about how I should dress. You know, I thought that you're supposed to dress to impress. You ever heard that, right? Dress to impress. Or hey, dress for the job you want, right? That's not what the Bible teaches, necessarily. I don't think you got that from the Bible. You know, I don't, I don't care if we get our beliefs from pop culture in the 1700s or in 2024. Both are wrong. We need to get our beliefs from the Bible. You know what I'm saying? There, look, there's women who dress very modestly in the 1700s, my friend. In the 1800s, many women dressed very modestly. Listen, being old-fashioned doesn't automatically mean being biblical. Amen? Christians today, as much as ever, need to avoid, avoid worldliness. Worldliness is enmity with God. We need the blessings of God now more than ever. So we need to get on the same page with God now more than ever. Let's decide we're going to be careful. We're going to safeguard our hearts. We're going to safeguard our minds. We're not going to be lustful and covetous. We're not going to be like the world in our actions and our dress. We're going to be conformed to the word, right? We're going to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. And we're not going to allow our minds, our opinions, to be formed by the world. Our opinions and our beliefs need to be biblical opinions and beliefs. That's how we can avoid friendship 
with the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for telling us uh, how to avoid the pitfalls that will destroy us over generations. They'll mess up our family. They'll mess up our children's lives if we allow too much of the world. And we see the really, really sad example of Lot and how this has turned into tragedy after maybe three to eight, ten, something like that, maybe ten years or so. Living in the world and just being bombarded and having his righteous soul vexed, it destroyed his family. It just absolutely wrecked and caused shipwreck, and it was terrible. We, we need to stay away from the world. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have the discretion, the discernment, to know, hey, this is an issue. It is not wrong. This is a tool. Let's use this for the kingdom of God. It, use this for the glory of God. Let's use this to get the gospel out. But this over here, that's a vice. That's never going to be right. That's immoral. That's wrong. That's wicked. Help us to get those things from the word of God and help us to have discernment in those issues, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements real quick. I think I just have two here. You know I have them in my other Bible, but I believe it's the um, the family, um, whole family activity game night. 29th, that's what it was. The 29th of this month, we're having the game night. There is food. That is 5.30 p.m. on January 29th. Oh, we're going to be doing some cleaning that morning. We didn't write that in the board. So good, good. You know, the 26th. The 29th? 26th. 26th. He's got the he's got, he's got it in front of him. Okay. Why don't you get up and just stand up right there and read that? Uh, <laughs> the 26th, that is the day. But that morning, my wife just mentioned, we're going to do some cleaning. If you want to come out, uh, we'll make a big party out of it. We'll have, you know, uh, whatever those things are, cats and guns. But uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have fun uh, that day, and then yeah, that evening we're gonna be uh, having the like I said, it's a meal. Come on out, the whole family's invited. Lots of fun and enjoyment there. And then put it on your calendars. February the sixteenth is the, uh, the friendship, the, the Valentine's friendship banquet, and uh, it's gonna be a terrific time. We'll give you more details about that as we get those in here. Let's all stand if you would. Let's sing a song, number one eighty six. One eighty six, first and last.